4 beginning this evening. So if you find in your Bibles 1 Samuel chapter 4, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. So in the Old Testament begins Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and then 1 Samuel. So right after that. So 1 Samuel chapter 4. And if you don't have a copy of the Scripture, there are plenty available in the room. Uh, so if you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to go ahead and move right now and grab yourself one or uh, just, just wave frantically or look desperate so somebody will know you don't have your Bible and they'll help you out. They'll give you theirs and get another one for themselves or something like that. 1 Samuel chapter 4. And I'd like to uh, read uh, two verses and uh, in, in chapter 4, and then we're actually uh, going to go uh, down to chapter 5 and read a few verses there. So you found it, First Samuel chapter 4, and uh, let's go ahead and look at, I guess, verse 3. We're going to read three verses in chapter 4. Verse 3, 4, and then verse 11. So the Bible says, When the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the ark of the covenant. Now let's go down to verse 10. The Bible says, And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. Well, let's pray, and we'll ask God to give us help this evening. Specifically what I'm going to ask for, because we've got a little bit of ground to cover, is that God would just help us to be able to have an understanding, not only of the story that's here, but really to get the purpose or the point behind it. And so let's ask God for that. God, we want to not only uh, read the Scripture this evening and preach the Scripture, but God, we need understanding so that we can know how to live for you. And I pray that tonight, recognizing that we are not Israel, and recognizing uh, that the Ark of the Covenant is not with us, that, God, you would help us to understand the significance and importance of what the people in the day that this, this event occurred didn't understand, and that we'd be able to live in light of that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to have a hard time not getting ahead of myself uh, here this evening. And let me just recommend a, a few things for you before we get into our text this evening. Uh, when we preach in a series, like right now we're in the Gospel of John on Sunday morning. And man, I'll tell you what, you, you need to be in that series. And if you haven't, uh, haven't been with us the first two weeks, especially not this morning, but last week's message, would really orient you with an understanding of that particular gospel and some of the material that's unique to it. But it's also a good opportunity when the gospel of John is preached to invite visitors, people that you know uh, that are just open to truth. And I'll tell you, if they'll come to the series, they'll be a believer before it's over because that's a powerful gospel. And God's Word is all powerful, but the gospel of John just simplifies the way to find to be saved, the way for salvation. And then also I would recommend for you to read uh, consecutively, concurrently. And there will be two things that will happen. First of all, no preacher can preach everything that's in a single verse, far less a chapter or a book of the Bible. If I were to try to preach everything in the Bible in a series as I preach through a book, a part of the Bible, first of all, Sundays uh, when we get together would be preaching for probably, oh, I don't know, 18, 20 hours and I'd be able to get a verse or so done, maybe. The bottom line is that the Scripture is, is alive, and it's powerful, and it's just limitless in its scope. But one of the things that I am, am uh, responsible for when I preach through a portion of the Scripture is really helping the believers to have a sense of the Scripture, an understanding of what each part of the Bible teaches. And so it's important for you to be in each of the messages so that you get an overview. In other words, I don't preach one-off messages. They, they all tie together. But I also don't preach everything in the text. And so if you are not reading alongside, uh, if you're not reading the Gospel of John while we're preaching through it, if you're not reading 1 Samuel while we're preaching through it, there will be a lot of missing things in the context that are just not filled in in your, in your head. The other thing that's a benefit of it 
is that maybe you're reading along in John and you're like, man, Pastor, I hope you preach about this because there's some questions that I have or some things that I, that I need help with as you're preaching through. And so you're prepared for the preaching of the Word of God. Man, when I know what's going to be preached before I come and I read it, God's able to just do a better work in me as a result of that. So I want to encourage you to do that. Also, in particular, right now, we're right in 1 Samuel. Uh, this, is, this is just fun. It's fun reading where we're at in 1 Samuel. It's a good time. When I was a kid, uh, I hate to admit this, but I used to get grounded from reading. And I get in trouble uh, for reading. And the reason would be that my parents would, like my mom, would speak to me and I didn't hear her because I was away in another land in a book. And so she'd ground me from reading everything except for the Bible, because I liked reading encyclopedias. And so you couldn't say, well, not, only educational reading. No, no educational reading, no reading at all. My mom get mad. She's genuinely, thoroughly mad, right? So she'd ground me from reading, and I could read the Bible. And you know where I went? First and Second Samuel, First Second Kings, First Second Chronicles. And I'll be honest with you, I believe that a lot of, in a lot of good ways, my character was formed. Uh, from reading those portions of the scripture. For instance, and let me just mention this. It's not, we're not in the message yet tonight. For instance, today, today, young people lack courage. And middle-aged people lack courage. In general, people are just completely lack courage. There's nothing, about, nothing like reading about David. Grabbing a hold of a lion. Or now, you don't want your kids going out grabbing lions and bears. But, uh, you know, a young man that says, you know what, before I let something harm my sheep, I'll tear it up. And, uh, you know, David grabbing a lion, grabbing a bear. You look at what's happening in schools today. You look at, first of all, the cowardice of people attacking people. But you look at teachers running and hiding and kids getting underneath desks when somebody ought to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a motto today, some, if you see something, say something. No, you see something, do something. And we lack that in our society. We lack courage entirely. And it, it, it's amazing to me how people just just freeze and they don't respond and the word of god getting in you and getting in your heart and thrilling you with you know what first of all i'm eternal i don't have to fear death second of all god can do anything and if god doesn't want me to die no one can kill me i'm invincible uh you know we need a little bit of that and our, or we need a lot of it a lot of that mindset among our young people and young people get the get the word of god and just let god uh just shape and do the things in your heart like he did in david's and then, of course, the stories are just unbelievable and uh, the way that God worked and moved. And so that's all I'm going to say about that this evening. But here we are in a place in the Bible that for pleasure reading, I think, is just, I mean, it just gets better and better as you read through 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. Now, let's say a little bit about 1st Samuel in particular then. 1st Samuel is a part of the Scripture, portion of the Scripture, and of course it's about Israel's history. And it's a portion of Scripture that takes us from the transition of the period of the Judges. When God, instead of having a king in Israel, Israel was a theocracy, was an established nation, had its own land, its own country, and God was the king of Israel, and God was working through Israel using judges. And the judges in Israel uh, were, the word judge is a word for deliverer, and so they were responsible for leadership, they were responsible for justice, for judging between people and judging what was right and wrong in people's lives and ministering consequences on behalf of God. But the judges were also responsible uh, for being the spiritual leadership and, the, uh, spirit and the, the physical leadership of a nation. Well, we know that national Israel ended up having a king, don't we? Ultimately, King David. But 1 Samuel really brings us in that transition point between having judges and having a king. We're almost to our last judge. We've already been introduced to him. The last judge in Israel was Samuel. And so we saw Eli. Eli judged Israel. And last week we looked at the contrast between Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and between Samuel. The scripture said about Samuel, and in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 3, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan even to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. And uh, the Lord in, uh, appeared unto Samuel, and uh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh uh, by the word of the Lord. 
And then in other in in another place, let's see where is it at where Samuel didn't let any of God's words drop to the ground. You know what? Uh, let's see, it's a chapter it's three. <coughs> chapter three. Thanks, Charlie. What verse? That should be nineteen. Thir uh, nineteen. Did I read it? Oh, I guess I, I read. I begin. You read it. Yeah. I did. I read it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Chapter three, verse nineteen. Samuel grew. The Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. In other words, Samuel's attitude in contrast to Hophni and Phinehas was everything God says, every word of God is so precious to me that I'm going to retain it. We saw in contrast Hophni and Phinehas, first of all, God appeared to Eli and pronounced judgment on him, terrible judgment, because of the wickedness of his sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And then Eli's response was to go to his sons and say, Hey, you're not doing well. This is, you know, what's going to happen with this? You guys, this is bad. In other words, Eli said something, but he did nothing. And God's response when God gave Samuel uh, the word about him was that in verse 13 of chapter 3, I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. Eli spoke to his sons and told him, you're doing bad, you shouldn't do that. So in other words, he saw something and he said something, right? But Eli did nothing. He did not restrain his children and God held him accountable for that. And boy, I'll tell you what, there is some solid, hard truth in what God said about Eli. In other words, you know, if you, if you think about it, you're going to ask Eli, Eli, you know, what about your sons? He'd say, well, you know, I told them. I talked to them. I told them it was bad what they were doing. They shouldn't do that. God expected Eli to do something to restrain his sons. Proverbs 22, 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it. And it's incredible how oftentimes that, that uh, we uh, excuse ourselves for the outcome of those that we're responsible to raise. It's how, you know, it's, it's amazing how often we think that we are more merciful than God is in allowing things to take place. And friend, you're just not more merciful than God is. And so God held Eli accountable ultimately in our text this evening when we read a couple of verses. In verse 11 of chapter 4, we saw the ark of God was taken and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And uh, then in verse 18, if you were to read in chapter 4, came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God, this is a young man reporting, that he fell from this, off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck break, and he died, for he's an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel 40 years. And literally we see Eli passing off the scene when he finds out that the ark of God was taken. Well, this evening I want to just kind of focus on that matter of the ark of God. I want to look at it, and I want us to uh, see and answer the question uh, about the, God, the ark of God, about what was the big deal about the ark of God. What was the big deal about it? And I want to begin by first of all uh, <clears throat> bringing to our remembrance the importance of holiness, of God's holiness, and of course that is the crux of the matter. Last summer, uh, last year, all the things of portions of the Bible that we preached through last year, of course a lot of that even when you preach just really gets to your heart and really affects you. But the thing that affected me most last year was in the spring when we began our sermon series on biblical separation. You remember that? And we began our series when we went to Isaiah chapter 6 and looked at Isaiah's description of when he uh, was privileged to see uh, the holy, the throne room in heaven where God was. Where God is lifted up and He's between the, the seraphim and, and uh, they're crying, Holy, Holy, Holy. And as Isaiah saw the scene in heaven, of course, there was smoke and there was a voice that sounded like thunder. And it, it literally terrified him to death. And he, well, not literally to death, he didn't die, I guess. But it terrified him to the point of death. And so he, he literally lost all strength and fell down on the ground. And Eli's response to God's holiness was, Woe is me, for I am undone. From a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Literally, Isaiah's response when he saw God was to fear. And of course, that's the way we ought to be when we worship God. We ought to come to Him. Worship means to bow down. And Eli's response when he saw God's holiness was to worship. Worship isn't dancing and showing off and 
Worship is bowing. It's falling down on your face before God. It literally means to bow. Every word in the Scripture that's used for worship means to bow. Uh, praise uh, is oftentimes lifting up your voice or singing or making music or uh, uh, making statements to God or about God, but worship always means bow down. It's incredible today how the church has lost the concept of worship. And I don't mean some churches, I mean pretty much all churches don't know what worship is. They think it is showing off or telling God uh, what's, what worship is or defining worship your way. But worship's getting on your face. If you're not on your face, you're not worshiping. And so Isaiah's response when he saw God was to fall on his face. And he said, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And God had an angel take a coal from the fire on the altar and touch his lips and say, Lo, this said, touch thy lips, and it's, it's made you clean. And then, of course, we have that passage of Scripture, which is usually not preached within the same context. And it is that the, the, that, the, that Eli, or I'm not going to keep saying Eli because I'm preaching Eli and I'm talking about Isaiah. But Isaiah is, is here's the question, uh, who will go for us and whom shall I send? And his response was, lo, here am I, send me. So literally, Isaiah comes from the perspective of I'm unclean and I'm identified with everything unclean. In other words, I dwell in the midst of a, uh, of a, a people of unclean lips. I'm unclean and I'm associated with everything unclean. God cleansed Isaiah and now Isaiah is no longer separated from God, but he's now separated from the unclean individuals. And then Isaiah, having been cleansed, is sent to the unclean. You know, oftentimes we think that separation actually means that we're to withdraw ourselves because we're clean. And they're dirty. No, separation means that we're made like God and we're sent as holy ones to the unclean. Separation always has a strong distinction. A believer doesn't go into the world to reach the world by saying we're just like you. A believer goes into the world to reach the world uh, and says, you know what? You can be like Jesus. It's incredible how often the, the church today presents itself as a we're just like you concept. You know, uh, come to us as you are. Listen, God is a come as you are, but then it is be covered by the holiness of the, of the blood of Jesus Christ, and now you're different. Hey, Sandy, give him a little elbow because he's snoring. Everybody's staring. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs> now, I always get distracted by little things. <laughs> so, anyway, the, the reality of it is, is that's the matter. That's the crux of what we see here in 1 Samuel. All right, now, now look down with me, if you will, to chapter 4. And uh, let's look at verse 3. Let's get our, get our story here. We'll just draw some quick application from it. The Bible says, when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, where hath... Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant out of the Lord of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, notice that next that, that next word. It may save us out of the hand of our enemies. Now it is not surmising on my part to simply say that the fact that they thought that the ark of the covenant could save them is a reminder that they needed a he, not an it. In other words, the Ark of the Covenant, what did it symbolize? It symbolized the presence of God. In other words, that's where God was on the mercy seat. And so the notion that they had is very similar to what we see in Jeremiah when they're told of the demise of Jerusalem is prophesied. And their response is, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is at Jerusalem. Remember that? And so what they were saying by saying the temple of the Lord is at Jerusalem is nobody's going to touch Jerusalem. Nobody's going to destroy the temple because if the temple is destroyed, then obviously that's where God's presence is and God just can't allow that. God could not allow His enemies to destroy the temple of the Lord. And so their notion was we can live as we please because God is in that square building, that box where He lives in. That literally is the God in the box concept because God is in that place. Then... As long as we have that place in our, among us, then God can't do a thing in the world about us because what's He going to do? Let Himself or let them destroy His testimony? Listen, my friend, I want to say to you, God's testimony is always unharmed and unblemished. And His holy character and His holy nature, friend, are always, always, always intact in spite of what anyone who would claim to represent Him uh, do. 
Listen, when you talk about harm in the testimony of Jesus Christ, my friend, it is and certainly a fact that individuals who do not demonstrate God's grace in their life do a harm and a disservice to the cause of Christ. But my friend, God is still who He is. And let me say this for a help to you, lest you should ever fall into the trap of believing that what a person does is representative of who God is. Now, it's a wonderful thing when we see lives change and transform. But my friend, when you see a believer fall into sin, God hasn't sinned. He's the one who will chastise that sin if it's a believer. He's the one who ultimately will judge that sin if it's a lost individual. See, God is still holy, regardless of what any person would do. You be careful not to look at a person. You be careful not to hold up a man's person to the degree that if that person's fall, if that person falls, then you will see, uh, or it will skew your understanding and, and uh, your idea of who God is. God's still holy. And God is still who He is. And what a person does ought to affect you because you ought to know that isn't God that did that. You know, you ought to be able to say that to lost people as well. I've met many individuals who are angry with God. They're angry with God in the place they think they're punishing Him by saying they don't believe in God. But you know that's always a response, almost always a response to what someone has done in the name of God. Man, I'll tell you, religion, religion and uh, manipulative even believers do terrible things in the name of God. And what I want to say to you is God didn't do that. How many times I've said to people, you know, God hates what that person did to you, and so do I. You agree with God. You take God's side on the matter because God's always right and God's holy. But the children of Israel didn't think that Jerusalem could be sacked or plundered. They didn't think the temple could be knocked down because that's where God's presence was in the Holy of Holies. I have news for you, my friend. God is not restricted to a square building. He's not restricted to a box. And the notion of the children of Israel here that they had was that, well, well the Philistines are defeating us soundly in battle. What should we do? Well, let me ask you the question, what should they do? Do you remember what happened at AI with Joshua? Remember what happened at AI when they were soundly defeated at AI? They went in their own strength and then they were defeated by a little bunch of people that shouldn't have had a chance against them when they marched around Jericho and they'd gone to the other cities and, the, and literally God had just wrought a great victory. What did they do at AI? Yeah, they got on their face. God, what happened? Who is it? And I want to promise you that the Philistines would not have been triumphing over God's people had there not been things wrong, not only with God's people, but with the way that they were trying to have victory. When you find defeat in your life, you cannot assign the blame to God, first of all. But oftentimes it's because God's trying to get your attention. And He did get their attention, but it took a bit. And so they said, well, you know, let's get the ark. If we take the ark out there and God's there, I mean, we got to win, right? Again, it's like God's with us because we have Him in a place. Now listen to me because there's a mindset here. In other words, I can go where I please. I can do what I wish. And as long as I take the symbol that God is with me, then I'm endorsed by God. You know, many individuals use symbols. There are churches that are far away from the preaching, the teaching of what God's Word says, but they think because they've got a crowd that that symbolizes the fact that God's with them. How many times have you heard, well, you know something? Uh, God's blessing. Well, friend, what is God's blessing? What is God's blessing? Is God's blessing a crowd? Well, it could be, couldn't it? I'm not saying that excludes a crowd. Oh, there's a lot of people there. can't be right. Well, no, that us for no more mentality is not right either, is it? You know, being proud about not being successful at reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ is a problem for the church, just as much as thinking that getting a crowd is the same as reaching people for Christ. They're both wrong. Both those things are wrong. But the reality is that these individuals represent a mindset that says, if I have the symbolic presence of God, I don't need anything else. And so what we find is a group of individuals that are satisfied to have only a symbol of God's presence, and they're not concerned one whit about actually having God's presence and God's power in their lives. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that oftentimes we're concerned about dotting I's and crossing T's on doctrinal statements, and I'm not saying that isn't important. I'm not saying the Ark of the Covenant wasn't a legitimate Ark of the Covenant, but it did not belong in the place where it was, and it certainly could not be held by two individuals who are godless bringing it there like Hophni and Phinehas. 
Whereas the first thing they ought to be concerned about is if we want God to help us, then we better not get these guys that are laying in front of the doors of the congregation. And when sacrifices are offered, they're saying, give me the food now. Give me the meat now. And they're laying with the women and they're causing the children of Israel to sin. No, 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 my friend. They need to say, if God's going to be with us, then Hophni and Phinehas can't be the representatives. Because God wouldn't do that. So that's where the place should have begun. They didn't ask God. The first thing they should have done is gotten on their face. The second thing they should have done is ask God and listen for an answer. If God said, send the ark, then I promise you the ark would make a difference. But God didn't say that. God didn't tell them to do anything of the sort. They decided this will work. They worked at man's wit, man's wisdom. You know, it, it uh, breaks my heart every time I get a brochure in the mail that invites me to come to a church growth conference. And I read it and I think, well, church growth is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful one. How does the church actually grow? Well, it means people got saved. Right? That's how church actually grows. People got saved. People follow the Lord. Believers baptism. They're part of a local church. The church grows that way. But what they're actually talking about is how to attract people. And usually what they talk about when they talk about church growth has nothing to do with anything spiritual. And I'm not saying methods are bad. I think methods are wonderful. And if God endorses them, God says, sure, go ahead. See, well, so the time that we're concerned about is how can we be successful? How can we succeed at this? Or how can we cover up our mistakes? We're in the wrong place doing the wrong thing, so how can we make it work? I'm not speaking about anyone in particular, but I cannot tell you how many times in my life I have seen preachers and churches compromise truth because they're in trouble. How many times I've seen churches that you know once preached the Word of God and uh, were faithful to the Lord, and they went and bought a building... Oh, we need a bigger building. They got a big, beautiful building. And all of a sudden found themselves in debt. And then they realized, I've got to pay the bills. And all of a sudden, all the pastor preaches about is money. Huh. Just every single week. Man, you know, you need to give to the Lord. You need to give to the Lord, which means give to me or give to this church. You know, and, and then the second thing that happens is they start changing the message. Well, you know something? I can't preach about that. I, this person will leave the church if I preach that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, they, if people start leaving the church, we're never going to be able to make our mortgage payment. I don't know how many times I've seen that. Countless times, over and again. Friend, you need to ask God before you go in debt. You need to make sure that God's with you when you make a move. And when God's with you, then you don't have to worry about anything because God will take care of you. And so we find here with the Ark of the Covenant that same thing. Now, I'm not trying to turn the Ark of the Covenant into the church and all these things, but the problem is the same. The problem is a skewed concept of how God works. And friend, if you think God works because you've got Him in a tight spot, and it'll be his reputation that's in the problem. Friend, God's reputation by anybody who looks at him will never be tarnished. He's holy. And that's, that's that. That's the way it is. And so ultimately the ark of God is taken. Then I want to look at the second thing, a couple more things that support what we've looked at this evening. If you look down in chapter 5 and verse 1, the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. And when the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. When they have Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon, I love this. this uh, when I was a kid, I remember reading this and just laughing. Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him up in place again. And when they arose early on the morning, on the, on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod unto this day. Well, that didn't go so well. Hey, let's go ahead and add the symbolic presence of God to the uh, temple to Dagon. I don't want to preach about Dagon or what he symbolized. It doesn't really matter. He's just a pagan idol, just a false god. But what happens in the morning, Dagon's bowing to the ark of God. Then they set him back up the next day, his head's cut off, his hand's cut off, there's just a stump left him. Well, that's a problem. You know, thinking people, thinking people ought to say, you know, Dagon's not much good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Dagon's not much compared to the Lord, to, to the Ark of the Lord. And they ought to ask the question, you know, how do I worship God? How I worship God. And I cannot say to you that individuals did not respond that way. But the next thing that happened was a judgment where literally people were dying and they were having what's called emeralds. 
uh, which is a tumor or hemorrhoid or something like that in the secret parts in verse 12 of chapter 5. The Bible says the men that died not were smitten with the emeralds and the cry of the city went up to heaven. And so things didn't go well for the Philistines taking the ark of God where it wasn't supposed to be either. Now let me ask you a question. Who allowed the Philistines to triumph over God's people? God did. Who, <laughs> who allowed the Philistines to take the ark of God into Ashdod? God did, but you know what? God had a, a mind about it, didn't He? And so I want to read James. I just want to read, this is just a story, it reads like a story here, and I want to read some, I want you to pay attention because I can't spend a lot of time, uh, we, we have to make a conclusion here in a moment. The Ark of the Lord, verse 1, was in the country of the Philistines seven months, and the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the Ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to this place. And they said, If you send away the Ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, that he shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall be the trespass offering? They answered, Five golden emeralds and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. And so then I want to go down to verse uh, 7. Um, now therefore make a new cart and take two milk kine, on which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kind to the cart kind or, ca or cows, and bring their calves home from them. Okay, now for you non-agricultural farmer type peoples, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of city folk probably don't know that if you take a cow and its calf at milking time, the cow's going to find its calf. Got that? A cow knows when it's milking time, and the cow goes where it's supposed to go. If you're not there, the cow will let you know that you're late. A, ca a cow that needs to be milked is very very vocal about it. And so if anybody that knows how to, anybody here good at mowing? Brother John, would you move for us, please? What's that? Mowing? Yeah. I can milk. I don't know. Oh, you can milk. I said mowing, not milking. Okay. All right. Do you no know milk for us? Okay. You milk for us. Okay. So a cow. Is that kind of like a cow? It's more like a cow than a horse, right? So. All right. Well, so then a cow starts making it and they get loud. They get loud, they get demanding. It doesn't. If it's their time, it could be 4 a.m. or 4 p.m., but they will let you know. <laughs> if a cow has a calf, it will find its calf. And if you separate a cow from its calf, well, you, it's not easy to do that to begin with. Let me tell you a story so some of you all wake up. My uncle raised a lot of cattle, and uh, we, I grew up on a farm, and we, we were a farming family, but my mom's side of the family, my uncle, they, they were agricultural farmers. We also were, so we grew crops. Uh, but my on my mom's side of the family, my Uncle Gene had a lot of uh, cattle as well. Still has a lot of cattle to this day out in western Kansas. And uh, one time Uncle Gene decided it was time to wean a cow from its calf. And so he took the cows, I, I believe it was the calf, and he put it on another side of a gate, on another side of a fence. And uh, the cow proceeded to jump the fence. And so he did something else. No, I, I remember this. The cow was being real obstinate about it. And uh, he got physical with the cow. I'm not going to tell you what he did because y'all, some of them earth hugging pe things that think that animals are more important than people. But people that raise uh, animals for meat know that uh, you've got to be the boss of an animal. And so, anyway, he tried to let the cow know that he was the boss. And so the cow took off chasing him. And he jumped a fence, and the cow jumped the same fence. You know cows can jump fences? Mm -hmm. My uncle says, jumped a fence and put him on a haystack or on a, a round hay bale. So the calf's on the other side of the fence now, and the cow and my uncle are on this side of the fence. And he stayed on the hay bale until the cow decided he'd learned his lesson. <laughs> and then the cow went back to its calf. Well, all I want to say is you don't separate a cow from its calf. So the idea here that the Philistines have is that we are going to separate a cow from its calf and it's not going to leave. Matter of fact, you wouldn't, have to, you wouldn't have to fence a cow. You could put the calf in a pen or tie up the calf and the cow would stay in proximity to that. So they took two cows and put them on a new cart, put the, uh, put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart, and ultimately the cow started heading off down the road toward Israel. Went down the road and they were mowing, the Bible says, as they went. That brings us to where we're at here. So you guys understand this? Verse 10, the men did so and took two milk kine and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home. 
And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart, the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds. And the kind took the straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh. And went along the highway, lowing as they went, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. And when they and they of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, a Beth Shemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. They clave the wood of the cart and offered the kind of burnt offering unto the Lord. Now let's stop there just for a moment. And uh, let's just say, could we agree this evening that it was, the, it was God that was moving the cows? In other words, God's the one that sent them away. And by the way, no, good, no cow in her right mind would leave her calf and go somewhere where she's going to be caught up and burned for a sacrifice. <laughs> okay, so um, this is not Chick-fil-A or anything affiliated with it okay, here. So these, these were not eat more chicken cows. They were like sacrifice cow cows. All right, verse 19. Uh, the Bible says in verse 19, And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh, this is speaking of the Lord, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord, even he smote of the people 50,000 and three score and ten men. Anybody know how many people that is? Mm -hmm. What's three score? 60. 60. Plus ten? So 50,070 men. Think on that, will you please? Of the town I grew up in in Salina, Kansas, is about 45 to 55,000 somewhere in there. It'd be the entire city dead. This is not just a you know a little thing. This is a massive, major slaughter of people. What people were they that died? Israel. Yeah, they're Israelites. They're God's people. Why is it that they died? Because they looked into the ark. Because they looked into the ark. Do you get the idea that God is holy and that His holiness is nothing to be taken lightly? No. Get the idea that God is holy and His holiness is nothing to be taken lightly. It's incredible how oftentimes we're guilty of saying, well, you know, I just believe God. We better find out about God and not just believe something. The men at Beth Shemesh say, said, well, hey, you know, I mean, the cows got close to it. It should be no problem if we look into the ark. What's in that thing? When the Philistines leave, and they all walk up to it like it's just nothing, hmm. and as though God's presence isn't represented by that ark. Friend, let's conclude this evening. I want to look at some more uh, scriptures. If, you like, if you're taking notes tonight, I could give you some verses to jot down. You could go to chapter 6 and look at verse 19. Uh, you could uh, go to 1 Chronicles chapter 13 and look at, uh, in the time of David, uh, what happened when they moved the ark without God's permission. And you, can, you can go to these scriptures and cross-reference and see that it was not a new thing that God cared about the holiness of the ark. Matter of fact, before we finish, I want to go to Numbers chapter 4 just really briefly because I, I got ahead of myself and we never went there tonight. But Numbers chapter 4, and if you look at verse uh, 15, so Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, and look down at, to, is it verse 15? Yeah, when Aaron, this is speaking of just the, the service of the Levites, when Aaron and his sons had made an end of the covering of the sanctuary, all the vessels of the sanctuary, as the camp is to set forward, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it. But they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. If you were to read further, you'd see that in setting up the tabernacle, each time the tabernacle, which is a portable worship place where God's presence was, there, the sons of Kohath had the job of carrying things there, but they couldn't touch anything. They couldn't say, "Well, let's just go through the, you know, the services, uh, service of the temple, and get the cups and the candles and the uh, different instruments out." Of it. No, they didn't. They, their job was to carry things, and their job was not to touch things. In other words, this brings new meaning to the whole "stay in your lane" idea. Don't do something that God doesn't want you to do. There are individuals that are bothered because God hasn't called them to something He's called someone else to. How many times I've met disgruntled Christians in churches who are upset because God's called somebody else to do something that they think they should be called to do. Uh, there are individuals that covet positions that other individuals have. And my friend, that's a dangerous place to be. Don't touch things God hasn't given you. You do what you're supposed to do. And so what had happened uh, in, in, our, in our context in 1 Samuel uh, is that these individuals looked into the ark. And you're not supposed to look. You're not supposed to touch things. You're not supposed to look and touch. 
And oftentimes we as believers go more on the basis of what we think than what we know. And I'll tell you something, we would do far better to stop and say, God, what do you think and what should I know? Instead of telling God what we think and what we know. And we could read on a number of scriptures this evening about the slaughter of individuals that God loved. Hear me now. These are not individuals that God did not care for. These are not individuals God was angry with and wanted to destroy. But these are individuals who did not take the holiness of God seriously. Sometimes I've had the question, and I, I'm going to close my Bible because I just want to comment on a few things now. Sometimes I've had the question about individuals that seem to be careless about holiness. For, let me give you for instance. Um, I have dear friends that have gotten saved in Christian rock concerts. They got saved at Christian rock concerts. you know, and, and it always confuses me. Because I have heard Christian rock music and I've met Christian rockers. And the thing about them is that it seems like a, uh, a little bit of a... Um, what's two words that uh, don't go together? You know, like Christian uh, rock. Christian rock. rock. Yeah, you know, it's just like... You know, I know what rock music represents. My dad, that's my dad's background. You know, I'll tell you what it represents. It re represents alcohol, drugs, and uh, immorality. And that's the nicest way I can put it, but that's what rock music represents. That's its genre. And so, Christianize them. Christian alcohol, Christian drugs, drugs, and Christian immorality. Or we could just, let's just say sanctified. Sanctified alcohol. Sanctified drugs. Sanctified immorality. That's what Christian rap seems like to me. For What's a Christian? What's a rapper? Well, a rapper is a gangster, right? What do gangsters do? Well, they commit crimes and they abuse women. That's what rappers do. Uh, I don't recommend that you do it, but if you ever hear a rap song when you're out on the road, don't listen to one on purpose. You hear a rap song, it, it's what, what they talk about is abusing women and committing crimes. Right? I mean, honestly. So let's Christianize. Let's sanct sanctified abuse. Sanctified crime. That's what Christian rap is. Okay, so I have a problem with it. I see things pretty clearly white and black. There's not a lot of gray areas as far as things like that go for me. Uh, and by the way, I think for any thinking person, I don't want to insult you this evening, but I just want to say for a thinking person, it's not difficult to understand. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's pretty simple, isn't it? The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Pretty simple, isn't it? So I know individuals that have gotten saved at Christian rock and Christian rap concerts. And that, quite frankly, confuses me. Does it confuse anybody here? I'm not talking about, yeah, Joel does too. Probably most of us do. And I'm not going to be those people, ah, they're not saved if that's where they got saved. Listen, if they trusted Jesus as their Savior, Jesus saved them regardless. I was helped some years ago by reading Philippians. Chapter, uh, chapter 2, I believe it is, where Paul talks about individuals preaching Christ out of envy and strife and contention. And, uh, the, the idea behind their preaching was that they were supposing to add affliction to his bonds. And his response was that he rejoiced that Christ was preached. And so I will say, regardless of the forum or the presentation, if Jesus Christ and the gospel is preached, God will save people. And, but here's... here's Here's my perspective on that. God will save people in spite of the messenger, not because of the messenger. God will save people because of His character, not because of their character. And you know, that may be something I can say about somebody, and you may say, well, Pastor, that's a mean thing to say about them. Let's not talk about them. Let's talk about me. You know, I don't want God to save somebody in spite of this messenger. You hear me now? This evening, in other words, I don't want to preach Christ out of envy and strife and contention. So the question then is, okay, if individuals are doing things that seem to contradict the holy character and nature of God or to disregard it, then how are people being saved? Oftentimes people, well, we, how many people you haven't saved? Listen, let me just tell you this. Man, I, there are individuals that doctrinally, I just have to say, I just wholeheartedly disagree with. The late Billy Graham, for instance, is a confusing individual to me. He just confuses me. My grandma was saved under the preaching of Billy Graham. Dr. Richard Shermerhorn, a good preacher, friend of mine, older pastor, was saved at a Billy Graham crusade. I don't know how many people I know that were saved under Billy Graham crusades, but the man, if you listen to the things that he said, I mean, he's, in, he's being interviewed, and he says things like, well, you know, Jesus Christ is the way for me. 
But I mean, Islam may be the way for Muslims, and Catholicism may be the way for Catholics. I'm sorry, but my friend, that's not unclear. That's clearly apostasy. But God used Billy Graham, and let me tell you something, a lot more people are in heaven because of Billy Graham than are probably ever being in heaven because of Ryan Price. People actually know who Billy Graham is. But God does know who Ryan Price is. You know, a lot of times we worry about things on a pragmatic basis. In other words, the question you have to ask yourself, would I rather be Billy Graham or would I rather be Ryan Price? Well, you know, God didn't give me a choice on that. Did He? God didn't call me to be. God called me to be myself and to preach the gospel the way that I know is right. You know, what God sees and what God has in heaven for us is a lot different than the way we see things. And it's a good reminder for us to seek the heart and the mind of God and to know confidently this is what God wants in my life. And then be what God wants you to be. Hear me, Christian? You couldn't do better than what God's best for you is. And God's best may not look impressive to me, and it may not look impressive to the other folks in this room, but if God is pleased, my friend, that's the same as His being impressed. And I'd a lot rather have God be pleased with me than I would do something that makes a lot of sense without God. Because you could say that what the children of Israel did, you know, kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You know, if the ark was here, it's not likely that the ark, anything's going to happen to the ark. And they were actually right about that. They just didn't think it all the way through. The ark was actually just fine. But no one around it was it did well. And the same was true for the Philistines. Hey, we're going to add a God to our temple to Dagon. Well, you know, God really was a great God. But it didn't help Dagon anyhow. It didn't help the Philistines anyhow. In other words, God's not in a box and He's not limited to your perspective, your mindset, and your thinking. He's who He is. And if you want God to work in your lives, by the way, I'm glad we don't live in an age when only the priests in the temple have the right to access to God. And that's another message. Friend, you and I need to know what God thinks and what God wants. First place to try to find out what God wants is right here in this book, His Word. Amen. He's revealed Himself right here in this book. And you know, there's so many individuals that they just read this book and know that isn't what God wants. Or this is what God wants. So many Christians are so worried about God doing a big thing and moving in a great way and sending them somewhere or going somewhere with them, but they're not actually concerned with just finding out what God wants. They'll overlook all sorts of things in order to get to a place where they want to hear or see God, but they never look where God is. And He's here in this book, my friend. This is His Word. Amen. Don't neglect the, the empowering, filling, ministering, teaching, sealing spirit of God in us. If you never be still and listen, take the Word of God and let it speak to you, and then just be still and say, God, speak to me. God, I won't move until you tell me to move. God, I feel as though I need to make a decision, but if it isn't the right decision, it wouldn't be any good anyway, so I'm not going to make a decision. A lot of times, we as believers, we look at right or left, either or, and we never even question whether it might be neither. Well, I have to make a decision about this, do you? Do you? You know, I could tell you countless times in my life when I've come to the place where I thought, I can't make a decision about this. I need to find out what God wants. And God's response is something altogether different than anything I ever thought of. And friend, it's never been inferior to anything I've thought of. God's way has always been the best. Amen. And that's what these individuals lacked. They lacked God's presence. They lacked a personal relationship with God. And so they just used Him as a token or as a symbol. He was nothing more than a cross on a chain around your neck that's used for a charm. Mm -hmm. Nothing more than a charm hanging on the mirror of your car that's supposed to protect you. My friend, a charm doesn't protect you. God does. Mm -hmm. Charm doesn't give you victory. God does. And the ark was to the children of Israel and to the <clears throat> Philistines. Nothing more than a good luck charm. Well, God's a person. And He's an extremely holy, powerful person. And everybody realized it, but for some it was too late. And here we are hearing the Word of God preached. We're all living, we're all breathing, and God hasn't destroyed us. And so for us, it isn't too late. Let's learn from their examples. Father, thank You for what we've learned tonight. I ask that You would just convince us of it, and Lord, help us to be able to navigate our lives this week in light of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your great attention tonight. You're dismissed.